blood-sucking, poisonous, flesh-eating pests. They're really already going to town. They make our skin crawl. Now, once the eggs get into the body, the eggs hatch. Yet they're healing our wounds and curing everything from our allergies, headaches, to maybe even our most deadly diseases. They suck your blood. We're gonna put one of these right inside of your belly button. You ready? Yep. I can feel that stinger injecting into me. This is the 21st century, and this is cutting edge modern medicine. Quick, what comes to mind when you see a slew of flies? Bet your answer includes this word, death. But flies can be precious lifesavers if you're a diabetic with an open wound on your foot. The stats are dramatic. One in almost 12 Americans has the disease. And every 20 seconds around the world, someone loses a limb to diabetes. If you're at risk, this is the man you want on your team. Called the world's thought leader in amputation prevention, Dr. David Armstrong goes to extremes to save extremities. We have nothing better to actually clean up a wound than larvae, than maggots. You heard correctly. A fly's hatched eggs may be your best chance to keep toes intact. Dr. Armstrong, how are you? It's really good to see you. Diabetic Steve Frederick has been told by previous doctors that his foot should be amputated. Well, let's see what we can do about this today. Steve's infection goes deep down to the bone, but now he'll try anything because this is a special year. Uh, I want to walk at my son's wedding. God it's coming up this year. That's awesome. <laughs> it's going to happen, all right? You better tell those things. Get going. I used to be a lot more active. I'm in a wheelchair for the last two years because of the foot infection. Steve is a man that's had uh, everything thrown at him uh, in the past from uh, stem cell therapy to fancy biologics to uh, skin grafting and others. And now we're going, we're going old school. So first, we're just gonna take these out. And what we're gonna do is try to coax our other little friends out of here. You like that? This particular fly species loves dead flesh. The larvae remove only the necrotic or infected tissue. Plus, they're warriors on another front. Right now, we are in a, an antimicrobial arms race. There are some bacteria that are now uh, completely resistant to all antibiotics. What is wonderful about larvae is that they may help to reduce the need for the unnecessary use uh, of antibiotics. This is the most environmentally correct way to heal a wound in a lot of ways. This is great. So here they are, a little couple more in there. They're really small here. You can see them crawling on here. But after just a couple of days, they're just going to be many, many tens of times the size. It's really extraordinary. They're going to be eating me for a meal. That is amazing. I was grossed out at first, because that's all we think about. We see a dead animal, maggots in it. Oh, don't worry, they're not going to yeah. turn into flies or anything. No, I, no. I, I, don't, I don't think they are not going to fly away. It would make a funny story, but I don't think that's going to happen. All too often in medicine, there's this element of arrogance. And how can we be so arrogant as to discard some therapy that's been around for a while only because it's been around for a while? Not because it doesn't work. This isn't hurting you at all, is it? No. Awesome. Maggots have cleaned wounds and rid the body of infection since long before the Civil War. But with the invention of penicillin and other antibiotics, maggots were discarded and forgotten. Until now. The use of maggots were thought of as passe, and so they sort of fell out of favor. Um, not because they didn't work, but just because there was this amazing wow factor with penicillin. The larvae will eat away the dead flesh over the next 48 hours, leaving behind healthy skin ready to heal itself. I've had this limb for 56 years. I'm not ready to depart with it yet. Let's just make this better, all right? Dr. Armstrong has hundreds of success stories to back up his optimism. This patient came into the clinic last October. 
She's another diabetic with a festering foot ailment. This is the evolution over three and a half months. Or even more dramatic, check out this woman's recovery over the span of five months. Diabetic amputations may eventually be a thing of the past, thanks to a grisly past remedy. Thank you very much. You, me, and our little friends. <laughs> to be sent home with maggots in my leg, I don't know if I could do that. I couldn't do that for two days, no way. I wouldn't like to go to sleep and know it's still there. <laughs> I would do it, just because, I mean, if someone was to ask me, well, what happened to your gangrene? I'd be like, maggots. <laughs> maggots cured me. Fast forward two days. Maggots are already proving proficient as little surgeons. Do you remember how necrotic yeah, things were? Yeah. And now look at that beautiful granulation tissue. Steve, hey, just looks great, yeah. This professional headshot is real, magnified 70 times to show off this doctor's toothy grin. It might not be a meal fit for a king, but it's one that should get a father back on his feet in time for his son's wedding. While maggots work their magic for diabetics, another squiggly microbe may someday soon help the one in five Americans with autoimmune disorders. Diseases like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes have mushroomed in the 20th century, possibly because, at least in part, to the loss of our exposure to intestinal worms. Helminths are usually painted as being evil. You know, things to kill, things to despise. Do you ever see the movie Alien? Uh, the alien is a big helmet. Yeah, it gets in the GI tract, grows into a beast that comes out of you and destroys you. But in reality, some parasites may coexist and even help regulate our immune system. Chad Amon suffers from Crohn's disease, which has ravaged his GI tract for more than eight years. Round one. My intestines were ruptured. It happened right here in my living room, and I... My wife was asleep on the couch, and I woke her up, and I said, I think we need to go to the hospital right now. And the next thing I know, I woke up after surgery, and they had taken out a chunk of my colon. Chad is one of the 70% of Crohn's patients who requires surgery to remove a diseased section of the colon. This is what a healthy colon looks like. And here's one destroyed by Crohn's disease. The clamp points to a tear in the intestinal lining that led to emergency surgery. In this case, 85% of the colon required removal. The easiest way to understand it is it's just ulcers that run your entire digestive tract from your mouth all the way down. And that the ulcers get so bad that they eat right through one organ and into another times, and even in some situations outside of you. Therefore, it's one of the most painful diseases on the planet. Crohn's deteriorates your joints, causes fatigue, and constant fevers. Chad describes it as having the flu 24-7, but life goes on. It definitely is hard on you as a musician because I have been on stage in an enormous amounts of pain. I act like everything is fine. I call it putting on the mask. And the second I'm done, I am gone and in the bathroom and double over in pain. These are not easy to treat diseases. You're facing diarrhea, abdominal pain, surgery, um, treatment for life. Well, what are people taking today? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve bottles right now. They're taking prednisone. They're taking immune suppressants that can cause cancer and make them susceptible to infections. Chad has saved almost every bottle of meds he's taken since diagnosis. What's terrible about it is, is that it's gotten no better. So how might pig whipworms resolve what appears to be a hopeless condition? Dr. Joel Weinstock's aha moment came when he discovered an odd coincidence in modern history. Helminths have been around in our environment for at least 60 to 100 million years. Dinosaurs had helminths in their GI tract. So these are very long-lived relationships. But in the 20th century, we take these long relationships, we break them, and there can be negative consequences. Inflammatory bowel diseases seem to spike at the same time as the deworming of the population. Back in the about 1950s, 
um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease from perhaps one in every five to 10,000 people. Today, it's approaching one in every 250 people. Can you imagine what life was in 1900? What was the most common form of transportation? Horse. Can you imagine what streets were like and what was on your shoes and what you brought into the house and the dust in the air? So what soil is today isn't the soil of um, um, the last generation. In our haste to rid ourselves of filth and purify our plumbing, the industrialized world helped eliminate exposure to parasites. You swallow an egg. Where's the egg? It's in the soil. It's in this pig's waste. People are shoveling it. Kids are playing in the soil. Billions of eggs all over the place, because when you touch soil, you bring things to your mouth, or you may eat vegetables that are not well washed, and these microscopic eggs get into your mouth and into your GI tract. And it's possible some of these exposures are healthy. Dr. Weinstock put his theory to the test. This tube contains about 5,000 eggs. In one clinical study, 21 out of 29 Crohn's patients actually experienced remission when taking whipworm eggs. What if I told you that you can drink a small liquid that contains an invisible agent that can arrest the disease and you only have to take it once every two weeks and it doesn't cause diarrhea, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't cause cancer, what treatment would you select? I would be willing to try it because honestly nothing else has worked and because I do believe that that is why Crohn's has become so prevalent in America. The FDA has the final word, but if approved, millions of people with all sorts of autoimmune disorders may be trading their pill boxes for bug juice within five years. We could be on the verge of a major discovery, not only to treat these terrible diseases, but also to prevent them. For some, waiting seems like an unnecessary evil. And I do not wish to see people running to a less developed country to be exposed to potentially dangerous organisms. People need to be careful. We need to wait. But if you are one of the 44,000 people experiencing an asthma attack today, you may be anxious enough like these people to let parasites pierce your skin and crawl to your gut in a desperate search for relief. Asthma cases are skyrocketing across the country. One in every four emergency room visits involves an asthmatic. So girls, are you a little bit nervous for this trip here? <laughs> There's a little apprehension, but it's just the unknown. Don Donahue and his sisters, Samantha and Penny, are among the 60 million Americans who suffer from asthma and allergies. Years of breathing problems and pain make them desperate enough to try a parasitic experiment that's illegal in the U.S. We've been taught all of our lives, these are horrible parasites. You don't want them anywhere near you. All three siblings want to avoid taking any more nasal steroids and are willing to introduce themselves to hookworms for a chance at clear sinuses. I tried just about everything that traditional medicine had to offer, and I was pretty much fed up with the whole thing. This will be Don's third visit to a small holistic clinic in Tijuana. He credits the bugs for relieving his nasal congestion and allowing him to smell again. I have been taking medicine for years. I've had two surgeries on my sinuses, and I've been getting migraines since then, so um, long time. I've exhausted all possibilities of healing myself. The medications don't um, make me feel any better. Hookworms are very much in the experimental stage. While small doses in controlled studies show some promise, they can cause some severe anemia, protein deficiency, even mental slowness. These are not the same worms as the ones in Dr. Weinstock's research. Hookworms are found in our dogs and cats and other mammals. We're almost there. Time to go. How are you? Good to see you. 
Dr. Jorge Yamas refers to himself as a holistic practitioner. I'm Penny. Don and his sisters are ponying up $2,300 each for a round of treatments. A little bit of nervousness, anxiety, but I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to get it done. Hold on me, please. I've tried so many traditional therapies and haven't gotten good results. I am so ready to be healthy again. Okay, it's going to be safe. It's going to eat. Okay. Other than that, I really don't expect any problems. Okay. Right? Moment of truth. No backing out now. <laughs> you cannot see them. It's, they're microscopic. Okay. But this is, this is what it's all about. All right, let's, let's do this. Okay. okay, make me better. The procedure itself is quite simple. Dr. Yamas places worm larvae on an adhesive patch. It's kind of scary to be putting things in your body that most people are trying to get rid of. How long do I leave this bandage on for? Three hours. Three hours. Tell me when you start itching, okay? That is important. And that's it. It's a little weird, but I'm still very hopeful that it's going to give me good results. The worm larvae begin to burrow through the skin after five minutes and soon enter into the bloodstream, leaving a telltale sign. It's itching. Already? Well, I guess they were hungry. I guess so. <laughs> That's good. It's almost like a pinching itch. Uh-huh. It's definitely setting in my head that it is organ living organisms going in. I don't want to visualize it. That might make me queasy. <laughs> the larva's journey through the body takes less than a week. First stop, the lungs. You don't feel it but the larva prompts the lungs to create phlegm. You are likely to clear your throat, and that brings the phlegm and the larva to the mouth and then down the esophagus. The larva comes to roost in the small intestines approximately three days later. They munch on bacteria and grow for three weeks, at which time they earn their name and hook into the intestinal wall, and that is when they jumpstart your immune system. People say we're experimenting with these, and we are. On the other hand, the big experiment that I see was done a hundred years ago when we got rid of all the helmets out of our bowels. Worms typically live one to two years, laying eggs daily that pass through the body before hatching. It's so nice to see you again. It is, yeah, it is, isn't it? My worms are getting a little old, I think, so it's time to maybe re-inoculate. Uh -huh. yeah. That would be wise. This is important to me because I can breathe, I can smell, I can sleep better, and I feel much healthier. They would like to live, they want to live inside, but they don't want to kill you. They, they, actually, they're going to eat out of you, so they want you alive and be happy and prosperous because if you do, they do too. I guess we're the worm club or the patch club. Something like that, aren't we? <laughs> I'm lucky I can go to Mexico and be treated by a Mexican doctor in a country that is maybe less squeamish about worms in the intestines. Don is hooked. As someone who has suffered with severe allergies and asthma for his entire adult life, he's never felt better. Let's go. Still squeamish? I would absolutely not take worms if the doctor prescribed it. Yeah, totally oh, icky, man. I think if I could cure my asthma, I would try just about anything. I will stick with the allergy <laughs> pills. <laughs> Let's dip our toes into something a little less slimy. Can you guess the number one service at most nail salons? It's the pedicure. Latest fad? The fish tank. Oh, it's cold. Something mysterious is drawing new customers to Yvonne's day spa in Arlington, Virginia. Even men are curious. Her male clientele has increased 30% since the creatures from the deep arrived. These minnows, known as the Gara Rufa, are ready to exfoliate. I think the fish are going to be doing a little bit of nibbling, I expect. Um, I hope it's not too much nibbling. I'm scared. So scared? Yeah, a little bit. My boyfriend complains about my feet a lot. He says that they're too rough and I don't take good enough care of them. She's wanted to get a pedicure and I told her I would go with her because her feet are pretty disgusting, but I wouldn't go unless my brother went with me. I told him he was uh, a chicken and that I would go with him. Oh, 
you are the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. It's a cracking right here. Huh? Ooh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm always the one that gets a hard time about having rough feet, but after seeing BJ's feet, I think that he needs it more than I do. This is not a treatment for the squeamish. Let me count one, two, three, put it in, okay? One, three. No, two, two, one, two, three, I'm just teasing. Go in, don't no scare. Just don't no scare, go in. Not be nervous. All the way. Yeah, lift up a little bit. Okay. Ooh. Just go in, don't scare. Don't be. Yo, look at Ryan, look at Ryan, oh my god. It's buffet, oh you can eat buffet. Ooh, you can Does it hurt? <laughs> Forget the loofah sponge. These tiny carp fish will make your feet as smooth as a baby's bottom simply by gnawing on dead skin. They're all over me. Yeah. I'm a fireman. The guys I work with have no idea that I'm here was trying to keep this low key, but I'm sure they'll find out about it and give me a hard time about it. It's often believed that the fish eat the skin. Oh my gosh, it is so weird. In reality, these toothless carp are foraging for algae, sucking and peeling off skin in search of food. Just kind of unexpected as to where they're gonna get you next. They then lather your skin with saliva. It's believed to have an enzyme with healing powers leaving the skin smoother and softer than you could ever imagine. But those with ticklish feet, be forewarned. I would not like fish nibbling on my feet. Not in a million years, ever. How do you know that's all they eat is day of skin? I don't know if I could deal with the tickling. My feet are so ticklish. Yeah. Oh, it's not like a piranhas are attacking you. Get out the water, you'll be silky smooth. The results are better than a foot scrub. Okay, let's be see. Here comes Next. the true test. Let me see, let me see. Wow, look at this. Feel it. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That looks great. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> yeah, look at that. <laughs> I'd probably tell the guys at work about it, and I'm sure some of them would be interested after they're done laughing at me. Some U.S. states ban the practice citing sanitation concerns but the fish pedicure fad continues to spread. When I went to Greece this past summer, they were everywhere, like literally on every street corner. It was like the new Starbucks over there. It's soothing feet in Japan, France, and England, just to name a few. But in Turkey, it's a full body feeding frenzy. The Gararufa, or doctor fish, are native to Kangal, Turkey. Selenium-rich waters, along with the fish, not only exfoliate the body, but potentially help alleviate skin conditions. Psoriasis sufferers come by the thousands. They visit again and again for relief that no modern medicine has brought them. And the results are astonishing. Legend has it, in 1917, a shepherd bathed in the waters and accidentally discovered their therapeutic effects. The pools have been expanding ever since. From arms and legs to mouths, it's a full body treatment. But if your ailment is more localized, you can benefit from something that gets the blood flowing. The one in 200 of us who've lost a limb can benefit from this sluggish vampire. And so can those of us who simply crave a cleansing spa treatment. This is a leech, and its job is simple, to suck your blood. Oh, that's a lot of leeches. Oh, that's wild. I mean, they're good for fishing with. I would not believe that leeches were a cure in this day and age. So most people think of leeches is, is from the Middle Ages. If you had tonsillitis, they would drop a leech on a rope down into your throat to attach to the tonsil and suck the, the evil blood out of your tonsil. But this isn't just medieval science gone mad. 
This is real medicine that goes back 3,500 years. And Dr. Harry Hoyen of Cleveland's Metro Health Medical Center always has a stash on call. This is one of over a thousand hospitals worldwide that uses leeches. They're not just infesting swamps, lakes, and rivers. They're taking over our bodies and saving life and limb. Here's a uh, cut of the finger. This would be reattached or replanted in this fashion and then reattach the arteries. Dr. Hoyen is reattaching a finger to a hand. Usually his patients come through the ER doors. Today, his patient is a cadaver. We can sew an artery back together and bring the blood in. We've reattached the artery here, but it's hard to bring the blood out of the finger. The tiny little veins in the back of your hand here, uh, often you can't sew. That's where the little suckers come in, to get the blood flowing and veins working again. Most patients respond in disbelief. I always tell them that we might have to use leeches. I don't think anybody ever listens to me. But panic surrenders to compliance when it means saving a finger. He's looking for some blood. Let's see if he likes it. Look at that, he's all the way on. He's hanging there perfectly, and that's exactly what they do. That's perfect. The leech's 300 teeth pierce the skin. It then produces a secretion that stops blood from clotting. This freak of nature then gorges itself on fluid as much as five times its weight. This keeps fingers alive until veins can naturally reestablish themselves. This is really modern medicine right here. Using nature to improve the blood supply to a finger and keep it alive. Factory worker Daryl Kirkwood Jr. knows firsthand of the bloodsucker's value. You know, the EMTs come in, they stick the morphine drip in me. You know, I'm asking them, you know, am I gonna be okay? Employed at an industrial fan blade plant, Daryl caught his hand in the equipment, severing three fingers. Unfortunately, only one could be reattached. Hey, Doc. Hey, Daryl. How are you? Good to see you today. So this is a little follow-up. When we used the leeches, they were here at the nail, weren't they? Yes, they were. He saw the leech. He's like, wow, this is just, it's twilight zone. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wake up at some point, and this is all going to be gone. I think after the second day, he sort of accepted the fact that, wow, this thing is keeping my finger alive. So they're just sitting there sucking. You can see them getting fatter, fatter fatter, fatter. Well, when they, you know, obviously when they're full, they fall on my bed and I have to like, you know, get up and move around and find the leech. They will live until they're done sucking. They, they sort of die a glorious death of uh, blood engorgement. Keep on working on getting it bending and then let me see in a couple months, okay? Okay. Honestly, I still feel that they're nasty creatures. But when it comes to a medical science thing, I would recommend it because it worked it saved my, it saved the tip of my finger. You don't need to lose a limb to appreciate a leech prescription. These healers offer a host of health benefits for any of us. Today, leeches are gaining popularity for everything from skin grafts to facials. Would they take away wrinkles? If they did, I'd definitely try that. I don't know if I'd want that on my face. I'd be worried it would harm it in some way. I wouldn't personally do that for beauty because I don't really need to. But for others, this is tried and true medicine. Oh, hello, hello girls, come. Hello. This is a famous leech doctor, this is Victoria. Nice to meet you. She wants come to get some healing. Okay, good. Clinician Irina Brokowski is a staunch believer in an old wives' tale. From my country, from the Eastern Europe, everybody remembers their grandma having the little jar with leeches on the uh, window, and uh, she would use it for her varicose veins or hypertension or for her knee. So it was a common home remedy. It's a wonderful decision. You know, prevention is the most important thing. So how are you feeling? Are you a little bit uh, nervous? I'm a little bit afraid of them. <laughs> 
Her patient Victoria is a heavy smoker who's looking to heal her body from years of cigarette abuse. And don't worry, it's gonna be very good experience, okay? Mm -hmm. So let me show you my little healers. And they are, they are real healers, they are real healers. I love them, it's <laughs> my heart and soul with them. Oh my God. I'm, I'm afraid of them. They look a little bit scary. <laughs> but I heard they are cute and they're not uh, painful when they bite. <gasps> Irina begins with Victoria's liver. No, no, no. <laughs> oh. No, it's, it's kind of fun. She found the right spot. Oh, I feel it. You feel it. So what do you feel? Actually, it's not painful. It's like a little bit like burn. Like, like small, small, small burn. Like stingy? Yeah. Holistic medicine believes leeches are nature's mechanics, draining the blood of impurities and releasing beneficial chemicals that reduce swelling and relieve pain. Leeches came back really big time in Europe and Asia and still in a kind of embryonic stage in this country. Nasty. And I thought the leeches were going to be a lot smaller, but they did. That's gross. Okay, yep, no. Mm -mm. Oh gosh, it's awfully bloody. Oh no, I would not put it on. really big. Yeah. <laughs> You're rolling. <laughs> the full tune-up takes an hour. They're almost done. They became big. Wow. They're working. And leaves the customer 100% satisfied. Oh, 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 it's going out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, darling, for your wonderful work. I feel so good. You feel good? Mm -hmm. I'm relaxed. I was sleeping. I love them. I fall in love with them. I feel so good and relaxed. Wow, I like it. I like it very much. More than a third of Americans and two-thirds of the rest of the world depend on, or dabble with, alternative medicine. Maybe it's because the latest science is proving that nature and even its most loathed creatures bring comfort to inflamed joints, weakened immune systems, and even headaches. Many people suffer from apophobia, the irrational fear of bees. Perhaps because bee stings cause three to four times more deaths than rattlesnake bites. Yet more and more, doctors believe the bee's sting soothes far more than it slays. I've been doing natural medicine for about 12 years, and I'm still amazed. I'm just amazed at the power of nature. Chris Chloronymus at the Comprehensive Pain Center in Salem, Oregon, specializes in bee venom therapy. Bees, and the medicine derived from bees, is probably the oldest form of medicine known on the planet. It's documented on cave painting walls. This is really an old, old, old therapy, and still well utilized, well received in almost every other part of the world except the United States. So we're putting on our protective gear. Beekeeper back, Bill Lewis is his own lab rat when it comes to bee therapy. One time I had bad pain in my elbows, joints, because of playing tennis or whatnot, and I had to move a, an angry colony at night, and I probably got 40 stings in each elbow. But forget the Advil. The amazing thing was the very next day, all that pain in my joints was gone. It's well known that beekeepers rarely suffer from joint pain. There's been some interesting research done, the most recent coming from Germany, where they looked at beekeepers all over the country and compared their rates of chronic illness to the normal population. And it was significantly lower. A bee sting a day might just keep the doctor away. Got a lot of bees up here. And just this morning. I got a call from a, a woman uh, looking for bees because she has some kind of a medical condition. I've had people with multiple sclerosis and have heard some amazing results on how that sting relieves symptoms. Eric, morning. Hey, how's it going? Good, good to see you. 
Last treatment, 16 stings. Yep. How'd we do? Um, pretty good, I got Eric it. Carlson has suffered chronic pain for 20 years. I can't do anything I used to do. Mm, used to lift weights, um, I was bench pressing just over 300, and now just day to day sitting in front of a computer, my thumbs swell up so bad I cannot use them. It's really noticeably decreased since I first started seeing you. He's tried a long list of pain meds over two decades, but today's treatment is the one offering the best relief. Eric's one of my newer patients. He has a genetic condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome that is a disorder where your joints are unstable, your muscles are painful, they stretch. As a little kid, I could fit into little boxes. I could fold my feet up to my head. I could just twist in ways that nobody could imagine. All of that as a kid is torture on me now. Erlos Danlos syndrome appears with various severity in about one in 5,000 people. And Eric has finally found some relief. I can't believe I'm paying somebody to sting me with a bee. <laughs> All right. That's right, a wild, buzzing, stinging honeybee. I prefer not to be stung because it really hurts. I will get up and run. Isn't the bee dying after it stung you? That's kind of a moral question. Dr. Chris Claronimus prepares Eric's treatment. Little nervous about a bee just stinging me. Most people in the world would run screaming from a bee. We'll start with the left shoulder, you okay with that? Mm-hmm. Okay. I was sitting there just waiting for that big sting, the immense pain, the swelling. You ready? Yep. There's one. All right, what do you think? Yeah. As the bee attacks, its stinger and its venom sac are left behind, and its toxins pump into the skin for up to a minute after the bee is gone. Whether straight from the stinger or harvested and injected by needle. All right, you ready? Yeah. Bee venom releases a component that reduces inflammation. Some believe it's as much as 100 times more potent than hydrocortisone. Rafael was one of my toughest cases. She suffers from mixed chronic headache disorders, fibromyalgia syndrome as well, all of which are all horrible in their way. She really had no break from them. We just could not get it under control. We ran her through the gambit of every Western medication combination there was, and just nothing worked, and finally, I broached the subject of bee venom with her. And now her pain level is consistently 60% less than it was. I didn't have a life. I was not living, I was just existing. And the bee venom treatments are helping with my headaches and with the fibromyalgia. Remember, lots of water, vitamin C, rest, right? For me, it's like a miracle. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll see you see later. You the bees' honey, royal jelly, and beeswax also help with healing, but they're not nearly as foreboding as the sting. And great, you saved the maddest bee for last. Oh, of course. And three. Yeah, he was the maddest. He was the angriest. When the bee stung me, it was nothing like I expected. How are you feeling? Fun. I expected that stinger injecting into me and the venom pumping in, and it wasn't the case. It was a little prick in the shoulder, a little bit of an irritant, and that was the end of it. Back in so they're done twitching. Make sure the venom sacs are empty and you've gotten the full dose. All right, here we go. All the pain meds, you read the side effects and it's death or loss of limb or blind. And with the venom injection, it's sore and itchy. I'll take that any day. Okay, those are out, feeling okay? Yeah. My biggest concern was, am I gonna grow wings? Am I gonna start stinging people? It's just a little sad to calm it down. Bee venom it definitely made me a believer in more Eastern medicine versus Western medicine and just handing pills out. I incorporate both Western medicine, biomedicine that most people would expect when they go to an MD, as well as Eastern traditional medicine. Now, I've done apprenticeships in China uh, as part of my Chinese medicine training. Word is spreading and fear is fading. 
An estimated 65,000 people use bee sting therapy in the U.S. Now imagine if another kind of venom, from the creature you likely fear the most, could fix almost anything. Don't look, but the ultimate cure might be underfoot. In the natural world, there are many kinds of venom that can both kill and cure. Snake venom is being used in lots of conditions, and mainly big conditions that affect us, like, like heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, pain. I mean, basically, venom can be used for some of the, almost all the major scourges on, on, our, uh, on our health. She said, watch out for snakes. I said, I will. Turn back to look at her, and as soon as I let, put my uh, left foot down, I felt something grab it. Jessica went to feed some horses when a rattler lunged at her leg. Everything started going real numb. My tongue, my cheeks, my fingers, my arm. Over here on that side is where the bite is. Closest to my toes. Snake venom attacked Jessica's body, destroying her blood and tissues. It's painful, really painful. When she landed at Loma Linda Hospital, ER doctor Sean Bush had only one way to save her life. All right, that's what we're waiting for. Anti-venom. So, I mean, the plan with her is, uh, so sh she'll get this dose in, we'll transfuse her, and then we'll recheck the serial platelet counts until we feel like they're stable. And I'm an emergency physician and a snake bite specialist. I also develop, help develop anti-venoms and test them in clinical models. So that's it, that's the first 10 cc. All right, so that's tolerated. We're gonna increase the rate. Make sure you tolerate it. If you do, then we'll go with it. It's a potion that combats the deadly effects of venom. The power of venom is, uh, it's like a two-edged sword. Um, it can make you really, really sick, or it can save your life. But the key ingredient needed to make the drug? Venom itself. Anti-venom is a medicine that's used to combat the effects of venom. And the way it's made is you get the venom from the snake, inject it into a host animal like a sheep, and then the sheep build up immunity, and then you harvest that immunity from the sheep, and that's anti-venom. There are over 20 million toxins in nature. Only 500 of them have been studied, but with shocking findings. I mean, the more we look, the more we're going to find something that we can t turn into a medication that we can help ourselves with. So don't squash that spider. It could save your life. One way that venom's used in medical systems is if a cardiologist puts a stent in your coronary vessel, to keep that open, they give a medication that's derived from pygmy rattlesnake venom. There's another venom-derived medication that's being used to uh, bust up clots. Uh, in the brain when someone has a stroke. That's from the Malayan pit viper venom. Another one is a medication, they're called ACE inhibitors. It's a whole class of medications that are used to treat high blood pressure. That's also derived from venom. Beaded lizard venom is now being used in drugs to treat diabetes. The Chilean rose hair tarantula, there's a venom derived medication that helps with heart arrhythmias. The highly toxic cone snail venom is used to treat pain syndromes. Scorpion venom can be used to limit the spread of uh, cancer cells in the brain as well. There's actually a venom that's being researched to treat erectile dysfunction. Um, so we kind of have a venom Viagra, and uh, comically enough, it's from the banana spider. Epilepsy, kidney disease, heart failure, the list of conditions that venom can now heal is ever growing. I think that venom has extraordinary importance uh, in the discovery and the development of medications and drugs um, that can help all of humanity. Eight days and 36 vials of anti-venom later? Those are the first steps to a very long road to recovery. Jessica walked again. Jessica's snake bite took months of physical therapy to, to bring her back to baseline. I don't think Jessica had lasting damage uh, 
She did tell me that she had bad dreams, and I think one of her dreams was a giant snake was, was chasing after her, so it left an impression on her for sure. But for every person that dies of a snake bite, there are 350 more being saved by or treated with drugs based on venom. Scientists have only scratched the surface of the toxin's potential.